So I've titled the sermon this morning, In the Father's Hand. And I have three specific tasks this morning. And the first task is that we're going to look at what this Feast of Dedication is. It'll just be a small portion of our time together this morning. So we'll look at the Feast of Dedication, understanding why John the Apostle put it into his gospel. Then we're going to look about the sheep. We talked about the shepherds last week. We talked about how he loves his sheep. And we're going to continue on with that theme this morning. Then we're going to address a very serious issue within the Christian church, and that error is conditional security. A lot of Christians feel that you can lose your salvation and that once you're saved, you can no longer be saved. And so we want to deal with that very serious theological error because it stems from Arminianism, specifically Wesleyan Arminian theology. So we're also going to take a good chunk of time dealing with this. And the fourth, we're going to discuss the realities and the benefits of our eternal security. I do not like the term once saved, always saved. I just like the term that Jesus saves and that's all there is to it. And if anybody's got a problem with it, they need to take it up with the Word of God. We don't need fancy titles to put on this wonderful truth. And so we're not going to be able to go through every single verse this morning. I'm going to do exactly what I did last week. I'm just going to focus in on the, on the major issues that we can take. We can hold on to them, put them in our pocket. And when we leave here this morning, we will be better equipped as believers and we will be more in love with our Savior. So let's just look at the first issue, and that is the Feast of Dedication. So again, when you look at your scriptures in John chapter 10, verse 22, it says, At that time of the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem, then 23, it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. Now, it's important that John put this in here. It's important that the Holy Spirit inspired the apostle to make sure that the feast of dedication was here. But what type of feast of dedication was this? Well, it was actually the eighth day winter festival, also known as the Feast of Maccabees. It was a feast to basically celebrate the victory that the Jewish people had at a certain point in their history. Today, we call this Hanukkah, or the Festival of Lights. Now we read in our in, in this in our scriptures of the second temple, well, excuse me, the first temple in Solomon's temple in Second Chronicles chapter seven. You read about a dedication to the temple. You read about prayer. You read a lot of stuff going on. And sometimes when we read in John, we think, oh, that must be what the feast of dedication is. They're going back and remembering this time of Solomon. But that would be an error because that's not what's taking place. We must remember that though the scriptures, though God was silent with his people for over 400 years, there is what is called the intertestament period. There is that 400 year span, when well, we just say in lazy terms, when God did not speak. And so what happened during this time is a pagan ruler rose up and what he decided to do is sacrifice a pig within the holy temple. And by sacrificing the pig, this riot arose basically right? The zealots rose up and the Maccabean war took place. If you read Josephus, you read other books, you will then come to understand it was the time of the war. And so when everything was said and done, the temple had to be rededicated. It had to be rededicated back to Yahweh because it was once contaminated. And so during this time, based on the tradition of Judaism, During all this was taking place, the rededication was taking place, they found a small amount of oil. And the small amount of oil in this little jug or jar, whatever you want to call it, did not have any kind of contamination based upon the pollution of the pig's blood and so forth from these pagans coming in and completely causing havoc. So they have this oil, and what did they do? They used that oil to light the lamp, the menorah. The menorah should have only burnt for a couple of hours. It burnt for eight days. This is why today they still call the Feast of Dedication Hanukkah or the Feast of the Lights. So there, again, Jesus is in this situation and he once again is making himself very, very public. He's not doing these things quietly. He's not skirting around the religious authorities. He is right front and center, and here he is now at the Feast of Dedication. It's the winter. He's in the temple courts, and he is teaching. 
We hear about this often in other texts, such as Acts chapter 5, verse 12. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they are all with one accord in Solomon's portico. So again, it was a constant place of gathering and getting together. So why does John mention this? Well, I don't know. I'm not going back in time and say, John, why'd you do this? But through studying, through looking at the text, to putting things together, we can realize a couple of things. Jesus made previous statements that he was the light of the world. He makes specific statements that he is the one who comes, and the light is among, among men. And at the Feast of Dedication, there would have been light as well being used. That's one thing. But what else happened at the Feast of Dedication? It was a time to remember It was a time to remember victory. It was a time to remember God's faithfulness, how Yahweh comes and Yahweh delivers. In fact, during the very Feast of Dedication, they would have read from Psalm 30, verses 1 through 12. So I see it perfectly fit today to read it now. So go to your Bibles, Psalm 30, verses 1 through 12. You'll notice that the only thing on the screen is a reference. No more verses. Again, each week, and I'll continue to do this, bring your Bibles or your phones. And if you're on your phones, turn off your Wi-Fi. So when you're reading the scriptures, you're not finding out who liked your recipe for pork chops. Are we there? We're all in our Bibles? Awesome. Psalm 30, verses 1 through 12. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies rejoice rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you healed me, O Lord. You have brought uh, brought my soul from Sheol. You have kept me alive, that I would not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you, his godly ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. Some of you may be thinking of a song you once knew. Verse 6, now as for me, I said in my prosperity, I will never be moved. O Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain to stand strong. You hid your face and I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I called and to the Lord, I made my supplication. What profit is there uh, profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness that my soul may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. Now, this is a beautiful psalm. It is the psalm that they would have been speaking either in Greek and Hebrew. It is the psalm that they would have been reflecting upon why they're rejoicing that God was the one who has always been faithful to them. And as they're thinking about this feast of dedication, they may not have understood who Jesus was in, in the sense of what we've been going through in this sermon series, but does just this not reflect Jesus? Does it not reflect that Jesus is the one? Here he is in Solomon's portico. Here he is at the Feast of Dedication. Here is the one who is the light of the world, the the red of life, the living water, and he comes to defeat the final enemy. He is here to bring victory. He is the one who is going to bring in the true temple, the corporate body of Christ, Jesus. And so though they say these kind of psalms, In these dedication times, I find it so interesting that Jesus embeds himself here. I'm not saying this psalm represents Christ. I'm saying this is what they would have read. This is what they would have reflected on. And now the true son of God is in their midst. And he's saying, by the way, I am the one who will give you victory over all things. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 58, The apostle Paul understood this. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable always, abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. And so now, we have all been tainted by our previous lifestyle. We have all been tainted by false gods and false worship. We have all been polluted. But Christ is the true victory, the true one who brings life, which he has been expressing over and over and over again, standing in Solomon's portico. It is a beautiful thing. There's no by chance with God. He is there by providence. 
So that's how this narrative opens up. And then, in chapter 10, we have some realities to deal with. Because he's there teaching truth. He's there teaching fact. He is there telling his people that he is the way to victory. But the people don't care. What do they want? An earthly king. They want a Messiah that will defeat Rome. They want a Messiah that's going to finally wipe them out and go back to the good old days. And do you not think for a moment while they're all there having the Feast of Dedication, realizing the victory of the Maccabean War that brought this to the temple, that if this guy is truly the Jesus, then why doesn't he rise up and just completely annihilate the enemies the way it was once done? They couldn't understand. This is why verse 24 goes and says, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us. Now, if you've been here at this church since last September, how many times has this been revealed? But they don't hear. They don't see. Verse 25, Jesus repeats a previous truth. I told you plainly and you do not believe. So again, he talks about the works that are being done in the Father's name and he's repeating the facts about the sheep hearing God's voice. He knows the sheep. The sheep know him. They hear his voice. They follow him. And then in verse 27 is where we're going to pick it up and spend a good chunk of time. Let's read it. Back, put your nose back in the text. John 10, 27 through 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now that's interesting, because if people believe in conditional security, which is going to jump in eventually here, how then are they able to make an assumption or declare that they have the power or the ability to contradict the very words of Jesus Christ? We'll get back to that. But the sheep, sheep hear the voice. So perhaps it's good to introduce the second point at this time. Sheep are students. We need to talk about this before I go any further. Sheep are students. His sheep are his possession. The sheep are those the Father has given the Son. They are redeemed by grace through that precious blood of Jesus Christ. A sheep is not a sheep just because they call themselves a sheep. A sheep is not a sheep based off personal merit or your own works or your own way to somehow master a religion so that you can work yourself to God. That is not what a sheep is. A sheep is livestock. A sheep is possession. A sheep belongs to the shepherd. And if you remember back in John 6, it says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. And so again, sheep are individuals who have been drawn by the Holy Spirit. Sheep are those who have been awakened by God himself. Sheep know that they are lost and they need a redeeming grace. Romans 8, 29 through 30. Sheep are for those whom he foreknew. He also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the first among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. And so a sheep is not a halfway sheep. A sheep can't be half sheep, half lion, half dog, half sheep. You're either a sheep or you're a goat. You're either in or you're out. You're either predestined or you're lost. You're either saved or you're damned. But a sheep is his possession. A sheep is a child of God. You can call them a born-again Christian, regenerate. You can call them children of God. You can call them many things, but the bottom line is a sheep is someone who has been saved. Now, since the Holy Spirit is the one who does the saving, he is the one who does the work. The eyes are now open. The ears are now opened. They hear, and this is what's going on. His sheep hear. The sheep understand Let's go back for a moment. If you remember last week, I said in the sermon that Jesus makes the reference to the doorkeeper and the shepherd and the hireling. He says to him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name. So that's a reference to intention. It's an intentional understanding. God knows you. He knows you by name. He knows your DNA. He knows your hair upon your head. He knows the day you were born, which you had nothing to do with. And he knows the day you're going to die, which you have nothing to do with. He knows you. And his sheep know him. However, here in verse 27, 
it says that there is a hearing as well. It might shock you that even though last week we talked about hearing one way, verse 27 is different. You see, in verse 27, when it's talking about his sheep here, hearing is to heed, not just to listen, but to pay very close attention to and respond. We would call this conforming. Many people claim to be a sheep, but sheep follow. And so somebody will say, oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, you're a Christian, so you're a sheep. Yes, I'm a sheep. Well, God says forsake fornication and stop swearing and stop gambling because those do not honor him and those are sins. I'm not going to do that. Oh, so you're sheep by name, but you're not conforming. You're not heeding to the voice of your shepherd. You're not obeying the voice of your shepherd. So is it possible then you're not a sheep? You could be a sinner in sheep's clothing. You could be a wolf in sheep's clothing. I mean, I've watched many cartoons when I was growing up with the sheepdog and Wile E. Coyote. And what did he do? He dressed up like a sheep, but he always got caught. He was always figured out. And mark my words, Jesus knows his sheep and his sheep know him. We can play games with each other where we cannot play games with God. So sheep paid close attention. That's what following means. So let me go further. What does a sheep look like? What does a sheep look like aside from the agricultural realities of the sheep that are dependent on a shepherd for water and for pasture? What does it look like to be a sheep or a follower of God? What does it look like to hear his voice and to follow Jesus in his footsteps? I'm going to pose this to you, and you may not agree with me, but this is the beautiful part about being a sheep. I don't care if you agree with me, because I'm just going to read scripture. And what a sheep is, is found very clearly here in the text. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. Same guy. We're in the gospel of John, and now we're going to turn to the epistle of John. He wrote three extra letters, and this is the first one. It says, by this we know that we have come to know him. Okay, so let's just pause. We have come to know him. What does Jesus say? I know my sheep, and therefore the sheep know him. And therefore, by this we have come to know him. So you can say by this, the sheep have come to know him if we keep his commandment. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandment is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now, it's one thing to struggle with sin. It's one thing to fall into sin. But it's another thing to get dressed up and dive six feet into sin. And so it doesn't matter if somebody calls himself a sheep. If you love sin, if you love rebellion, if you love lying and you love fornication, you love adultery, you love idolatry, you love coveting, you love all kinds of hatred, you're probably not a sheep because the sheep keeps his commandments. And though you cannot keep them fully, you need to understand something about the word here. This is not a sheep that's going to keep the Ten Commandments, but keep the very authoritative teachings and instructions of Jesus Christ. So you can't say you're a sheep, but hate what Jesus says. Well, I'm a sheep, but I'm also a Buddhist. Well, no, you're not. You are a liar. You you can't belong to him. How dare you call me a liar? I didn't call you a liar. Jesus called you a liar. Well, I don't like this Jesus. I know. That's why you're not a sheep. It just... It's very common sense. What else does it say? This is the one we don't like because it hits all of us equally. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus says to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So a sheep is a student, but a sheep is also one of self-denial. A sheep is one that looks towards Jerusalem. A sheep is not one worrying about the 401ks, worrying about their investments, worrying about the house, worrying about a better car. The sheep is not one worrying about what the people in the pew next to them are going to think about them. A sheep is one that knows one thing and one thing only. They have been redeemed by the gracious shepherd, the great true I am, and they go straight towards the cost, and that is to go to Jerusalem. They preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They live faithfully for Jesus Christ. They trust his word, and if it costs them their life, so be it, because you pick up your cross and follow him. Well, what else is a sheep? 2 Timothy 3.12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. So we know persecution is part of being a sheep. So a sheep is a student who walks in self-denial and is willing to suffer. So if a sheep doesn't sit there and go, I'm a, I just want to be a sheep. Yeah, ba, 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 ba. And they get all excited. 
And then all of a sudden says, hey, are you a sheep? No, man. I'm not a sheep. Pride months? I hate you Christians and your God that is so judgmental. You narrow-minded pig. That's not me. I'm a goat. (laughs) I'm not a sheep. Sheep suffer. Sheep are not lions. Sheep are not cheetahs. Sheep don't sit there and fight back like it's Rambo 3 against the Russians. A sheep is slaughtered. A sheep is abused. A sheep knows it doesn't belong to this world. Hence, a sheep is a student to learn how to do this. A sheep walks in self-denial. And doing those two things, a sheep is prepared to suffer. A sheep is also found in 1 Peter 2.21. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ who also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. So a sheep, again, is a student who walks in self-denial, who suffers and submits to the shepherd and how they treat everyone else. I used all those S's so you can remember. Student, self-denial, suffering, and submission to the shepherd. That is what a sheep is. Okay, we got that. We can pat ourselves on the back. We can go home. We can feel good about ourselves. When I wrote this, this destroyed me. Right here. Because a sheep is also found in John 13, 35. By all this, all this men will know who, that you are my disciples if you love one another. More so, Jesus says, love the way I have loved you. So a sheep is the one who loves everybody else. When you look around this room and you see brothers and sisters in Christ, you love them. You don't destroy them. You don't try to outpower them. You don't try to make them feel stupid because they're not the same doctrinal or theological perspective as you are. You truly have a care for them. When they hurt, you hurt. When they bleed, you bleed. When they're walking in sin, you're not like, I got you now. Your heart is just wretched, completely broken because a sheep knows that we've been given the greatest shepherd. When you see another sheep fall, you're like, how how could you do this? How could you walk away from such love and grace and mercy and compassion and kindness? So sheep follow, and following means to present themselves as a holy sacrifice. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, which is good and acceptable and perfect. So many sheep are like, you know what? Uh, Don't judge me. I'm addicted. I smoke three packs a day. It's not a sin. Okay. But is it holy and acceptable and pleasing to God? A sheep is a person who doesn't say, am what I'm about to do a sin. Well, I'm only cheating on my employer by checking out 10 minutes early every day. After five days, I get 50 minutes. I get an extra hour of pay. What's the big deal? It's not really a sin. But a sheep follows the shepherd, and they walk in such a way that they treat their bodies, they treat their tongues, their minds, they treat their possessions, they treat their conversations as things that are holy and acceptable to a living God because it says in the word, you be holy for I am holy. And the minute we say that, all the sheep, you know what we are now? We're all sinners saved by grace because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We get that standard and we're way back down here. So sheep is one, again, who has surrendered to Christ and is brought back up by his grace because we cannot do this without him. That's a sheep. John 10, 28 now. Back to our text. Because understanding what a sheep is, understanding what a sheep looks like, he says, regarding his sheep, I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hands. So very clearly, just from the text, we understand it's Jesus alone who gives eternal life. The doctor may be able to prolong your life by five or ten years, but you will die. 
Mark my words, all of you. You might be able to live comfortably on your 401k, whatever we call it here in Canada, your RRSP. You might buy a couple more years of happiness, but you will never have eternal life. It is only Jesus Christ that can give you eternal life. And if you're visiting this church and you're trying to find your way to God, you're trying to find a way to live, you're trying to clean up your life, you want to be religious, you can't. All you can do is cry out to the great shepherd, the true I am, and ask him to cleanse you from your sins. And when he cleanses you, then and then alone will you have eternal life life. The very word means that Jesus gives means to cause. Did you know that? It's not that just Jesus goes, here you go. Here's eternal life. He causes eternal life. There's no giving unless he causes it in the first place. So for all of you Christians this morning, you're only saved because the Father deemed it so. And Christ laid his life down to make it so. And the Holy Spirit applied it upon you because he causes salvation. It's beautiful. It's established. And there's not one person who can ever say the intentionally intellectually or morally became a Christian. So now, touching those three major issues, let's go on to another point. Sheep are secure. This is the error of eternal security. Without going any further, if you are in this room and you hold to the doctrine that you can lose your salvation, as a minister of the gospel, you are committing a very serious theological error. And I pray that what I'm about to say will help you and open your ears to the glorious truth. Because verse 28 makes it very, very clear. God is the giver of life. If you gave yourself life, then you can lose your life. God gave you your salvation. You were not anything when he saved you. We were the most depraved, wretched, stinkiest, filthiest worms that ever existed. Cow dung has more glory than what we were in our sin. And he saved you in that state. What makes us believe that for anything we do after that point, all of a sudden he's going to say, I didn't see that one coming. You're finished. Hold on to that. I want to examine three specific arguments. I'm going to go as fast as I can. One of the major common arguments regarding people who think that our, our eternal salvation is conditional, they use John 6, 66. I know, don't get carried away with numbers like, oh man, numbers. There's three sixes up there. This must be from the devil. No, it's Holy Scripture. In part of the teaching, this one verse says, as a result of the many of his disciples withdrew and were no longer walking with him anymore. I have heard those say you can lose your salvation based upon this verse. Hey, excuse me. One of your brothers throw that AC on up there. Can you double check that? Because I'm down like probably 15 pounds here. Thank you. I'm sure the people in the pews appreciate it too. So as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. The error that many people say that this is a proof test that disciples can no longer walk with Jesus Christ, and they will attribute such a verse like this and say, you see, they are backsliding. They were with Jesus, but now they walked away. They're no longer with him. The correction to that misunderstanding is that disciples in the Bible do not always mean true faithful believers. It simply means that they were students. They were individuals who were sitting under the very word of God, and just because they were sitting on it, it doesn't mean that they were ready. They were looking for an earthly Messiah. They were seeking signs and wonders. So the crowds that were with Jesus were often called disciples. So no, that verse doesn't work because that verse is also part of John 6. And John 6 is also part of John 1, 2, 6, and part of all the chapters of the gospel of John. Well, other arguments will go to the Galatian church, and they will use Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who disturb you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. 
So there are those who hold to a very serious biblical error that this verse means that believers were quickly walking away from their salvation, walking away from the grace of God to a different gospel. They were apostatized and therefore their salvation was finished. Correction. We must understand that the ancient use of the Apostle Paul used rhetorical arguments all the time. Rhetoric is constant within Romans, within 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Galatians, and so forth. The Apostle Paul is making a strong point here. Yes, there was some apostatizing taking place. There was some false teaching that was rising up and legalism going in, but Paul will never have theology that would go against Jesus Christ. So though the Apostle Paul is reproving Galatian, the Galatian church, though he is rebuking this church, he is not rejecting this church. Big difference. There is rebuking, there is reproving, but he he is not rejecting. God does not reject all of us when we get it wrong. Many people have gotten it wrong. We have all made serious errors in our theology when we're first starting off. And God does not simply say, you're done. Praise God to that. So we can hold on to this. Connected to this verse, they also use Galatians 5, 7 through 9. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come uh, from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. And so the error of this verse, it will show that believers, this is error, that believers who were once running are no longer running. And because of the false teaching, they are lost. They have accepted false teaching, so they are lost. In short, because of their intellectualism or their opinions or being misguided, they are now no longer a Christian. That's not what's happening. The correction to this misunderstanding is indeed they had a good beginning. They responded well to the gospel and the obedience of the word. But Paul is reminding them again regarding what is grace and the dangers of legalism. And the two can never be mixed together. And they need to get back on track and get focused on who they serve. So that's what's going on here. We have more. Because now we're going to get into the big one. Because I know some people either here or going to be online going, huh, this is great, but you're kind of skirting around Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. So, I mean, that just solves the whole issue right then and there, Pastor Steve. So, okay, let's deal with Hebrews chapter 6. Chapter 6, verses 4 and 6. This is a very difficult passage even for those in Reformed theology. It is a difficult passage for many to try to articulate when individuals want to come at it with presuppositions, okay? Let me read. For in this case of those who have once been enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, and have made, been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, have, been, uh, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to shame. There it is, pastor. This is it. They were saved. They had the Holy Spirit. They were speaking in tongues. They were passing the collection plate. Church was growing. They walked away. What's going on? Well, the error that people hold to is that they believe that those who are enlightened are the actual believers, and those who have fallen away have fallen from the salvation of the Lord, and therefore, because they were actually Christians, in their view of this verse, they've been turned over to a reprobate mind. And since they're crucifying the Son of God afresh, there's no way, no how, they can ever come back to salvation. And some Christians won't even pray for people to repent and come back to Christ, because look at them, they're reprobate. That's an easy argument when a brother and sister's in sin, don't you think? I'm trying to walk on their life. They're not listening to me. Well, clearly it's not my problem. They're reprobate. So off they go. But that's not what the verse is saying. The correction to this, and John Owen makes it very clear, he says that there are those who perverse this chapter and verse. And in the primitive early church, they mishandled it. Therefore, we have to be careful. So let's unpack this. Off with Owen. Let's unpack it. It's rather simple. I'm going to read it because this is a lot. My memory is not as good as some of yours. There will be those who had biblical truth spoken to them and they had an intellectual grasp of that truth. However, intellectual grasping is far different than regeneration. Furthermore, just as it was in the Old Testament, it is in the New Testament that there will be those who walk in a covenant community, and just because they're walking in a covenant community, it does not make them saved. 
just like in this church, there is possibilities with the numbers we have. You come in every Sunday, you listen to the word of God preach, you serve in our ministries, you even come up to the communion table knowing in your conscience you are damned in your sins, but you do it anyway. That's what he's talking about. It's this covenant community people. These people who have not been spiritually circumcised by the Holy Spirit. Second, verse 4, speaks of the acts of public repentance. This act of public repentance were common in the early church. They would go out and, I repented. It's great. People like the show, the big show. You know, it's like, hey, I got my buddy coming over. I'm going to throw some mud on my face and I'm going to rub my eyes with some garlic. And he comes over, brother, what's going on? Public repenting, bro. It's the same then. Well, we know scripture says that Esau sought the blessing with tears, but his repentance was not accepted. So just because there's an outward thing, it doesn't mean there's an inward. Three, being enlightened is simply being brought into the community, hearing the teachings of Christ. And of the faith, like I said earlier about the communion table. So again, just because it looks to part, it doesn't mean it is to part. And they have come to a knowledge of God to a certain degree. Can they even be saved? I would call that scriptural or biblical inoculation. Hey brother, you're good. And Jesus loves you. Don't you listen to these other Christians. You just keep on keeping on, man. You go to that Hillsong conference. You get loaded and drunk. Praise God in the Spirit. Sister, same with you. You just, you don't let these people tell you you can't follow Jesus that way. These judgmental Christians, don't you dare. And you start getting inoculated. And then all of a sudden you meet that one brother or sister. It's like, hey, I mean, the Word of God says, like, don't you judge me. Jesus loves me for just how I am. He loves me unconditionally. He loves me, me, my boyfriend. He knows what we're going through. Oh, don't you start on me, pastor. You get inoculated. And then you get hard. And you actually think you can be a Christian. You can say amen in a sermon and still be lost. That's what this verse is getting at. It is a warning for all of us that we can be part of a covenant community. We can be called. We can go to church. We can go to studies. We can lift up our holy hands. We can be baptized. We can sit at the Lord's table. We can do all of that and never have been regenerated in the first place. So when you take all of that and go back to John 10, 28, We are in the palm of the Father's hand and no one can pluck us out. That means the true Christian will never be lost and you cannot take certain texts to try to disprove that. He is the great shepherd. He is the one who takes us and keeps us and when it says that no one will snatch them out of my Father's hand, he even then goes on with how he does it. So let me ask a question. We're going long today. We got a pig out in the spit. Beautiful thing is, if I preach longer, less chance you're going to get botulism. It's a win-win. So let's keep going. I know, Ken's like, why is nobody eat my pig? <laughs> Pig's cooked. What causes us never to lose our salvation? Just yell it out. Something in your mind. Think of it. Okay? Okay? What about power? Power. We're talking about the power of the almighty God granting us salvation. And yet some finite worm thinks that we can simply overpower the almighty and say, you don't know what you're doing. I'm walking away from this thing. Nobody calls himself to salvation. Nobody accepts Jesus Christ. Nobody makes Jesus Christ Lord. He is Lord. He calls you to salvation. You are his by name. You are an adopted child of God. You are an heir of righteousness. You wear his crest. You are his child. How in the world is the all-powerful, mighty God ever going to toss you on your rear end because you can't figure this thing called Christianity out? It can't happen. He is life. He is life eternal. He is everything about life. That's what verse 29, 30 is so amazing. My father has given them to me. He is greater than all. Greater, powerful, all powerful, the almighty. No one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Verse 30, I and the father am one. 
He does nothing on his own accord. Nothing. Actually, this is a reference back to John 6, 37 through 40. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. That's a bad, bad verse for an Arminian. Verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me I lose nothing, but I raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Brothers and sisters, your mess, your filth, your shame, your guilt, your, all of these things, what you did last night, what you're going to do tonight, what your eyes see, what your brain is spinning on. Can Jesus love me? Will he love me? Will I make it? Will I get to eternity? The answer is always yes and amen. Not because of us, but because of him him. It's going to be okay. Like this should excite you. It should break you. It should destroy you that we have such a loving God that there is nothing that is ever going to stop him from loving us. There's nothing you can. There's what are you holding on to? What is it that you love more than this? Give it to him. Lay it at the cross. Confess your sins. Cry out to him. The pride, and it's so disgusting. Just give it to him. Because when you close your eyes, and it's over, and you see him, and your faith becomes sight, it's like, Father, Jesus, I I know. Lord, I, I, I know. But, but, I know. I know. But I, I get to come, yes. Forever? Yes. But I, I doubt it. I know. It's all done. It's gone. Do you feel the weight of this right now? Do you not feel that? It is gone. So why are we walking around fighting with each other? Destroying each other? Killing each other? Judging each other? He does not keep a record of wrong. No one, no one is going to pluck us out of his hand, not even you. So stop plucking believers out of his hand. And stop walking up to someone who's struggling and destroying that bruised reed and trying to snuff out that wick. Start praying for one another. Let's start loving one another instead of trying to destroy one another because we think we got it all together. He loves us. And last week, no one can rob the Father. No one. Praise be to God because as John MacArthur said, if I could lose my salvation, I would have lost it long ago. I covered a lot in my last page, so I don't need to go there. But let me just give you three quick points to take home. The first one is that we cannot play games with God. We can't. Everyone here this morning has a conscience. Con means with. Science means knowledge. You were born with knowledge. You know the difference between right and wrong. And so I pray that you have seen the glorious shepherd and that this is the day that you finally confess your sin. Confess it. All of us here need to confess something. And if you're not saved in this room and you know who you are because your conscience, you're with knowledge of your mind, you know who you are. You go to bed at night, you think you're going to be okay. I, I pray that you would just hear this and call out to him. The second thing is if you're saved, but you're struggling, maybe you're ready to walk away, give it up. Maybe you feel like, you know what, you can lose your salvation, and everything just seems to be slipping out of your fingers. I pray that this is encouraging you to dive in deep to the treasures of God's grace, and that you are so encouraged this morning over his love for you. 
And maybe you're here, this is the third, and you have not fully tasted the great joy that comes with our common salvation. You're saved, but the joy is not there. I pray that knowing you're secure brings that joy. That's my hope.